<laughs> Just look at the thing. How the science of consciousness can inform ethics. All right, so this is just kind of an, you know, off the top of my head, unscripted little video I just figured I would, uh, I would share. So first of all, <laughs> Richard Feynman, you know, used to complain about biologists, you know, making wild speculations about the nature of, you know, cells and biology without like actually spending hours and hours and hours looking at the thing, just like really kind of like paying attention to actually, you know, all of the observables. Just look at the thing. <laughs> I would claim we find ourselves in a similar situation when it comes to, you know, ethics, you know, philosophy and, 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 and uh, morality. So things such as like utilitarianism, whether, you know, it's like negative utilitarianism, classical utilitarianism and, and so on. Um, you know, they kind of like postulate these entities about like, you know, like happiness and suffering or pleasure and pain. Um, but you know, it ends up being very, very, very ivory, ivory tower kind of like academic uh, reasoning here without actually looking at the thing, looking at the states of consciousness, looking at actually how they behave, <laughs> what they are. <laughs> so I think there's like several very actionable things to do here. So first of all, if you do look at the thing <laughs> there are important implications so first of all like number one number one way in which consciousness research can inform utilitarianism mixed affect you know in a lot of philosophy um you know we talk about kind of like happiness and suffering we don't dive into the details about the fact that a lot of experiences are actually mixed i mean consider i don't know the the scenario where you just broke up with your girlfriend, but you're having fun at a concert and you need to pee. Okay, like <laughs> there's a lot of like positive sensations and a lot of negative sensations kind of mixed up in a pool of qualia. So what do we do about that? How do we quantify that? So here's another example. If you have, um, if you have like this naive view of let's just minimize pain, then there's like strange answers that you're going to have with the following question, which is like, if you have two persons, uh, person A is in a state of pure suffering, person B is in a state of pure happiness. In scenario number two is both persons are in a perfectly mixed state. You might want to even, you know, add like a third scenario where the two persons are actually in a completely neutral state with neither positive nor negative sensations. Well, a naive, you know, let's minimize pain view would perhaps consider the first two scenarios as equivalent. But no, you know, mixed affect is a thing. Actually, when you have a lot of unpleasant sensations together with a lot of pleasant sensations, unpleasant and un unpleasant, they sort of cancel each other out. You know, the, the, the roughness of the phenomenology in some sense counter is counterbalanced with the smoothness of the positive component. So that is one thing. I mean, I think like once you recognize mixed affect, mixed valence, a whole new crop of possible utilitarianisms actually become online. <laughs> um, okay, second is logarithmic scales that, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, a lot of uh, utilitarian calculations are, let's say, trying to increase the average or, you know, the sum of something like the, the total, you know, well-being score of people or something like that. But uh, according to a lot of converging evidence, you know, even in just like one to 10 pain scale, um, it seems at the, you know, QRI, and, and definitely I'm very convinced of this, that to a first approximation, the amount of pain qualia that is actually being reported essentially grows exponentially as a function of how far along you are in that, in that, in that scale. Meaning that, you know, the difference between a 10 out of 10 pain and a 9 out of 10 pain is vastly different, is vastly larger in terms of raw dolors, you know, like negative utils, like actual painful qualia relative to going from zero to one. So if you actually want to minimize pain in this context, you need to actually, you know, raise, <laughs> raise the, the scale to or use the scale as an exponent and then try to actually minimize that. Otherwise, you're not actually hitting the target and you're not going to be minimi minimizing pain. You're going to be minimizing something else, a different metric that actually doesn't matter. <laughs> it's an abstraction. Okay. Third, personal identity. You know, this is, has profound implications. Like um, a lot of utilitarian thinking assumes 
as a background assumption, closed individualism. This view that you start existing when you're born and you stop existing when you die. And in that view, there is, for example, a way to make it up to somebody that was like suffering earlier in their life and then became happier. Because in some sense, they're part of the same trajectory, the same being, the same subject of experience. Um, but I think closed individualism is almost certainly false. I mean, I, I just don't know how to possibly justify it in a rigorous way. I think the more likely and kind of undecidable possibilities are open and empty individualism. Empty being you're just a snapshot of experience and open individualism is you're the entirety of consciousness. <laughs> you're, you're, yeah, you're just kind of like a facet of like your true being and I'm another facet and your friend is another fa facet and so on. Well, this also affects ethics and morality deeply. I mean, like if empty individualism is true, then a snapshot of intense pain will just be a snapshot of intense pain. There's no way you can make it up to it. You know, and actually, you know, I think like from an empty individualist perspective, something like negative utilitarianism makes a lot more sense. Because essentially, yeah, if you're condemning an entire being to you kind of like eternal, well, with philosophy of time added into the mix, eternal suffering. Yeah, you know, I, I, in, in some sense, um, it makes the case, I think, that, that actually getting rid of suffering is the overriding priority. And, you know, pleasure is, you know, icing <laughs> on top of the cake, <laughs> as it were. Um, mm, lastly, the quantification of consciousness, uh, very related to personal identity. You know, the deep kind of like esoteric philosophy would be mixing this with the one electron theory of the universe. But yeah, I mean, essentially, I, I, I take very seriously that, yeah, the whole universe is actually a strange, you know, superposition interference pattern of just one particle. <laughs> how conscious you are is equivalent to how long that particle stayed trapped within the topological pocket <laughs> that is your moment of experience. <laughs> In that sense, you know, a lot of, I think, like, ethical issues might potentially be resolved in that, like, okay, like, we're all these one particle. And so you will be forced to live through the life of everything and everybody. And you will be spending a lot more time in very large experiences, um, relative to very small experiences, um, well, comparing them side by side, although in absolute terms, maybe you will spend most of your time just being a stray electron in the <laughs> intergalactic medium. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've been there. Just don't remember it. You just don't remember it. <laughs> well, okay, so like this might give us a way to quantify the amount of consciousness and in a similar vein, quantify, you know, in absolute terms, the measure, the, the moral measure of different pockets of reality, how much they ought to matter is because it corresponds to how long you're going to stay there, right? Like if you're just going to stay, you know, in a house for a day versus staying in a house for like a million years, <laughs> you probably want to decorate the house that has a million years, right? Like there's some, some, some like very like rational implications here. Finally, you know, things like the symmetry theory of valence and neural annealing, you know, actually, you know, philosophy of mind and, you know, science of consciousness also deeply impacts philosophy of ethics because it gives you a structural understanding of what pleasure and pain actually are. And, you know, I would love, for example, if we had a reality TV show of some sort where, <laughs> you know, you had philosophers of mind, you know, taking different drugs or something like that, or going to, you know, on a concentration retreat or something. And I would love, for example, to, to see... Yeah, yeah, you know, big, big shots taking MDMA and being recorded and, and talking about their subjectivity. And that is going to deeply, deeply inform any kind of, yeah, their, their, their philosophy of ethics. With that, well, I'll see you another time. I just wanted to share this quick thought. Infinite please, everybody. Take care. Hasta la vista. See you soon.